So we've been talking about uh, what is news and what makes a story, story framework and th things like that. And um, so the next, I ask you to come tonight prepared with your story pitches. The first half of the class, we're gonna spend some more time talking to Hillary, but, it, but I want it to be sort of a lesson to you because uh, one of the important things that journal, perhaps the most important things that journal, what journals do is interview people, we talk to people. We find out people's stories and that way, that's how we get their stories from them. Uh, you know, it's one of the many ways because it, it gives people the voice in our stories. Uh, we did the exercise uh, Friday where we talked about how to use quotes. And, and, and this is how you get those quotes is by having a conversation with people. So this is actually a continuation of your lesson, but it also is an opportunity for you to continue to get to know Hillary as the night goes on. And so, so I want to start with you. Um, what, one of the things, uh, I, I took this sort of traditional path to becoming a journalist, where I, I went to journalism school and got out and went to work for a newspaper, worked in television, some other things. But that's not, that's not the same path you've taken, and certainly not getting here tonight. And, and your work has been quite different than mine. I've focused a lot on hard news and politics and that sort of thing. So, so tell me a little bit about your journey and how it, how, what it is that, that you've done in the years that brought you here tonight. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, I just want to say how grateful I am to be here. This is my first trip to Africa. And so to have come to Ethiopia as my first trip is just a dream come true. And to see all of your beautiful faces is um, just amazing to me. When I think about my life, my um, grandfather went to school until he was eight years old, and my, or maybe nine, and my grandmother was able to go to school until she was about 15 and they worked on a farm, and my mother moved from the farm to the city, and she met my father. Um, my father's mother um, also lived in a small town. She lived in the southern United States when um, there was segregation, where black people couldn't sit next to white people, or and there was a lot of oppression, and so she could not take the oppression, and so she moved alone far, far away from her family to get away from it. And she raised her family. And it's so amazing to me that I'm here as the child of those people. <laughs> to be on the other side of the world. What? <laughs> it's just crazy. So, um, so in my family, so my mother and father, and there are three children, I'm the oldest. I'm Hillary. I have a brother, Jonathan, who's two years younger than me. And he's in Colombia, South America right now, helping them monitor the elections, make sure the elections are fair. He's never done that before, so it's an amazing time in our family. And then I have a sister who's younger than him. And um, I have some nieces and nephews. I don't have any children. And um, I'm the community auntie. So um, I always, I used to dream of being an artist. So you see all these colors I have on me. I, I'm a colorful person, I like art. I wanted to be an artist. But I come from a family where we had, we had money. I mean, we weren't hungry or anything, but not enough money for me to pursue my dream of becoming an artist. And so when I was um, applying to go to college, I wanted to go to art school, and my dad finally sat me down and he said, I can't send you to art school, you can't go to art school, you won't get a job. And so that was heartbreaking to me, but I pursued another path. So I went to Princeton University, which is a prestigious university, and I did well, and then I got jobs in business because I had to provide for myself. Um, but it was depressing for me because I didn't enjoy it. I mean, it was okay, but I couldn't imagine my, my whole life doing something that I didn't enjoy. And I knew a lot of stories in my family. How many people of you, of, of you were in the photography class? Okay, and you brought pictures that meant something to you? So I, right, of, um, so I have a lot of pictures of my ancestors and I knew how much they had struggled and sacrificed for me to have a college education. And so I didn't feel good about myself because I had a college education and all these people had suffered for me to be able to have these opportunities, but I was still scared. 
I was scared to pursue my dream. I was a scared, scared that I wouldn't be able to provide for myself. I was afraid that I would fail. And I wasn't, um, I didn't feel good about that. I felt like I wanted to overcome my fear. And so um, I'm a very spiritual person and God and I have, have, have a lot of conversations and I wanted to overcome my fear and become a writer. So I left my jobs in um, corporate America. I, when we were coming here, I saw Pepsi soda, right, that you drank, Pepsi. I used to work for Pepsi. I worked, used to work for big companies. I left the big companies and my friends thought I was crazy and to become a writer. And it's a very long story, but um, God, is, God is good. And I, um, and God connected me with a lot of opportunities and one by one, um, piece by piece, I took step forward by step forward. I was very afraid a lot of times, um, but over the years, um, God has helped me build, build a career for myself. So I do a lot of different kinds of writing. So I write for magazines. Um, are you all familiar in the United States, there's a magazine for women called Essence Magazine or Ebony Magazine? Okay. So there are two black magazines in the United States right now, basically, right? Ebony and Essence. And Black Enterprise. And Black Enterprise, right. So um, <coughs> I write for Essence Magazine, which is a magazine for black women, and I write for Ebony Magazine, which is a magazine just for black people. And so I usually write one article a year for each of them because they have a lot of writers and they try to give all of us a turn. I also write on the internet. Sometimes I'll write for a website called The Root, dot com, R-O-O-T, um, T-H-E-R-O-O-T dot com. Um, I um, work with people who, um, with experts and people who want to write a book. I help them write books. I um, work on, um, every Tuesday, I work on uh, an electronic newsletter get, that gets sent out over email for an organization in Los Angeles, California. Um, which is six hours away from me, so we work on the internet, six hours by plane. Um, and it's an, it's an organization to fight AIDS in the United States, so I work with them. Um, every other year, I lead a team of volunteer journalists from the United States to the International AIDS Conference when it travels around the world, and we report back um, um, the new research and findings about HIV and AIDS back to the United States. Um, but I, oh, then this is really cool. So when I write these books, I interview a lot of people and I um, learn a lot of information. And so I write the book, but I still know the information. So I also um, get speaking engagements where I can speak about black women's health, where I can speak about black children and education. And so I get paid to do speaking now. That's a new thing. So one of the, so, oh, and I work for myself. And so one of the things that I find as um, a self-employed writer, we call that an independent journalist or a freelance writer. Um, so as a, a freelance writer, you have to have income from a lot of different sources, a lot of different jobs going on at the same time so you can make a living. Um, that's too much information, right? No. <laughs> but I wanted to tell you a little about me. So what, one of the things I've tried to impress on the students this week is that, um, that our life experiences shape the stories that we tell and the way that we approach our storytelling. So you, you worked in, you went to Princeton, and by the way, Princeton is, is one of the most prestigious institutions in the world. She said it's a prestigious school. It's one of the most prestigious institutions of higher learning in the world. Uh, but you, were, you went to Princeton, you worked in corporate America. So how, has, how did that, along with, along with your upbringing, influence the kind of writing you do, yes. what you like to write about, and the perspective that you bring to that writing? Okay. Um, so I know in my family, a lot of people struggled and suffered and endured difficulties so I could have these kinds of opportunities. And I always, always want to honor them. So I don't do anything that would disrespect my parents or my ancestors or my family. That's rule number one in terms of my work. The second thing is um, I always try to respect other people. So I don't do what people call like gotcha journalism. So I don't try to embarrass anybody like, I never would embarrass anybody who I interviewed, um, but some people do that. They want the story, and um, um, that's important to me. Um, 
I like to give voice to people whose stories aren't normally heard. So I do, a lot of my work is in the African-American community, which pays a little less than if I did mainstream journalism for mainstream um, magazines. But I really care about my community. And I know that if I don't tell the stories in my community or if I don't do the work in my community, maybe nobody else will do it. So it's important for me to do work in my community. And um, um, I don't mean this to brag, but I, um, I am a resource. I have a lot to offer. And so I want to offer it to my community first. Um, I think those are, oh, and I always want to tell stories that empower people or heal people or help people live empowered lives. So even though I do all sorts of different kinds of work, I write on, new, well, on magazines, on the internet, books, my intention behind my work is always that the reader will um, read a story that leaves them feeling uplifted, inspired, empowered, more able to be the person who God made them to be and do the work that they're intended to do on this work, on this earth. So that's always the intention behind my work. And whenever I partner with somebody, that's always their intention as well. You know, th those are things that, that when you start to deal with, with uh, your storytelling and making your films that, that, that really can't help but influence you in a lot of ways. And, and, and continuing on the track of, of things that influence you, Sasha mentioned that you do yoga. How, how do you incorporate in, that into the rest of your life and into your writing? Mm -hmm. So I do yoga on Tuesday and Thursday mornings usually. And I like yoga because it teaches me to be very aware of myself and it also teaches me to calm myself. And sometimes my mind is spinning around with whatever. It could be with ideas, it could be with worries, right? And so um, yoga helps me center myself. It helps me, hear, it helps me hear myself sometimes through the noise of the world. Um, yeah. Um, what was the other part about the, how do I incorporate Yeah, how do you incorporate it into your writing? Writing. Well, first of all, writing involves a lot, sometimes it involves too much sitting, right? Sitting at a desk. Actually, I have a desk. It's a standing desk, so I can stand and write also. So your back gets tired, so sometimes I'll do yoga to stretch. Um, but yeah, mostly I use it to um, calm myself, to center myself so I can hear myself through the noise of the world. So, so you, you've interviewed uh, Angela Bassett and Courtney B. Vance. You've interviewed Venus and Serena Williams. Um, you say you, you like to, to, uh, to, to interact and interview empowered people. Have you, have you met the Obamas? Have you met President and Mrs. Obama? Oh. See, I, so here's part of my story. So I was a political reporter, right? I've met every United States president since Richard Nixon, except Barack Obama. Which, which just hurts my heart, you know. So, so have you met Barack Obama and, him, and, and Michelle Obama? So I have met the Obamas. See, I'm jealous. <laughs> <laughs> I met President Obama one time, but it was before he was president. It was when he was a senator. And it was when I was um, in Chicago visiting Michelle Obama, who I went to college with. Oh. Oh. <laughs> so Michelle Obama was one year behind me in college and we were very good friends. Her name then was Michelle Robinson. And um, yeah. Um, did you know, did you have any idea that she would kind of achieve the highs that she has? No, so here's the crazy thing, right? So you're in college right now and you just think about yourselves as college students, but 10 years from now or 20 years from now, you're gonna be accomplished in your careers and you're gonna be calling each other and supporting each other and helping each other and working on projects together. One of you's gonna be the filmmaker, one of you's gonna be doing photography, the other's gonna be writing the script, right? Um, so you're gonna rise up in life together and that's what happened um, with Michelle Robinson, who's now Obama. So we were just girlfriends. We um, worked at the same job. We were receptionists. <laughs> we were receptionists at, um, uh, at a place on campus. And then we were secretaries. Then what else did we do together? Um, well, she's, she came to my house one time when we had break for college, because I lived closer than she lived. 
and um, we were good friends. Now, after college, we moved to different parts of the country, and we kind of drifted apart. But when we see each other, we're good friends. Um, she's lovely, and you would like her. She's how very nice. Was, uh, how was after she became the wife of the President Obama? Yes, I have seen her since she has become wife of President Obama. I have a picture with her. I don't have it on me, but I have it in my house. Yeah. We're still friends. Uh -huh. We don't call each other, but I know how to get in touch with her. She's given me her people's contact information. But I'm going to call her soon. See, I haven't even met her, and she has her people's contact information. <laughs> I know how to call her. Yeah. Um, so, so you've interviewed a lot of famous people, and you like empowered people. Who have yeah, you can not I, Can I say yeah. something about that? Okay. So one of the, because I didn't really say this. So I like telling stories that empower my reader, right? But I also like working with people who are masters of something. Yeah. So Venus and Serena, they're masters of tennis, right? And um, Angela Bassett, she's an actress. She's a master. Her husband is a master. Um, the, for this book... The, there's, this book is the companion book to a film. So how many of you are filmmakers? So um, the people who I wrote this book for, they, did a doc, they made a documentary film. They're award-winning winning filmmakers. Um, this little girl, her name is Monet Davis. She's 14. She plays, she's the only girl who plays baseball, basically, in this league with boys. And she's a pitcher, and she strikes out all the boys. And um, so she ended up being, she's like so good, she ended up in the national championship of the children's baseball tournament in the United States. Well, do you know about Little League? Because there are international teams in Little League. Is there an Ethiopian Little League team? OK. Um, so she was striking out all the boys. She was um, beating all the boys. So, um, but she's excellent. So I like working with people who are masters of something, who are excellent of, of something. Because I want to be excellent, and I want to learn something from each of them about how to be excellent. Um, and then also, in my own life and in my own world, I can then share that with my friends, with children in my life, with, you know, um, with other people. So, okay, so what was your question? I was going to ask you, who have you not interviewed that you would like to interview? Okay, I have interviewed Venus and Serena Williams, but it was a long time ago. I would like to interview Venus Williams again um, because she is... Um, She's an amazing tennis player. She, I, the thing that I admire both about Venus and Serena is that they could start playing and then they might fall behind and then come back and catch up. And when I was growing up, I used to play tennis and I used to play volleyball. Do you know what volleyball is? Do you play volleyball here? Okay, so I played volleyball. I was a spiker and because um, I'm tall. And um, so, but when I got behind in a sport or in different areas of my life, if I messed something up, if I got behind, I would have a really hard time coming back from behind. And so one of the things I wanted to know from them was how do you come back when you're behind, right? And so I admire that about them. I admire that they um, um, became the first black tennis players in the sport to, to be the best in the world. I admire she has health problems. I admire that she's playing even though she has health problems. I admire that she's 35. And this is really important, for, especially for the women in the room. She um, almost single-handedly was responsible um, among the tennis players of this generation of getting pay equity for women. So women would play tennis and get paid much less than much men. Less, yeah. And Venus was very responsible. Um, she used her power as um, a number, a top, top ranking player to help other women um, get equal pay. And so she knew that if she paid, she was going to make a lot of money regardless. But she cared um, enough about other women who were behind her to really be an advocate for this issue. And so I would love to interview Venus and Serena. I would love to interview, I was thinking about this, I would love to interview Michelle Obama now. Um, I really like Christiane Amanpour who's an international journalist. I really admire her. She goes all these places around the world and I would watch her and um, wonder what it took to do that. Um, so those are some people who I would love to interview. You, you talked about with the Williams sisters um, admiring them for, for me being able to come from behind. So in your work every day, when you feel that you're bogged down or that you've fallen behind or you're not achieving the goals that you want to achieve, 
you know, where, where do you find the strength to catch up to where you want to be? Yeah. So this this summer, I was offered this project to write about African Americans and education for the White House, and it was so much work; it became very overwhelming. And the truth is, on almost every project I work on, there is a day or two, maybe even a week, where I feel really overwhelmed, and I wonder, am I going to be able to do this? Right. Now, I've had this experience enough that I know, okay, yes, I'm going to be able to do it, but I just have to be able to manage myself emotionally through the day or the week where I'm overwhelmed and I'm wondering if I'm going to fail. Um, but I'll tell you what Venus taught me. And this is what I love. I work with these people who are excellent, and then they teach me things, and I can teach other people. So Venus taught me um, that this is how she comes from behind, and I use this in my life. So she said to me, um, the thing that she knows, and she told me this when she was number one in the world. She said the thing that she does better than everybody else is she knows how to be in the moment. So she knows how to be doing the thing that she's doing right at that moment, like, bam, hitting her shot, right? And then forget about the thing she just did so she can do the, the next thing when the ball comes right back over that, the net. And so she's really good at concentrating on the thing right in front of her and then forgetting it so she's available for the next thing that's coming to her. And so um, sometimes when I worry, I'm not present to the thing that's in front of me. And so the thing that I've learned from her is to forget all the stuff around me, and then if I just focus on the thing in front of me and do that thing, and then the next thing, and then the next thing, and the next thing, it builds up and it becomes the finished mm -hmm. project, product or project. And so um, that's something that I learned from Venus Williams, and it's something that I apply to my life, whether it's my work or my personal life or something else. And maybe now you can apply it to your life. So, so you talked about learning excellence from people and, and then teaching excellence. When you feel that you have not lived up to your own standards, you know, what do, what do you do? How do you re-motivate yourself to, to go back to that, that you feel like, I'm doing everything that I can to be all I can be? How do you, when you don't live up to your own standards, what, what, what do you do to get back to that place? That's a good question, okay. In my work, I almost always live up to my own standards. Um, but sometimes my standards are so high, it becomes almost like tormenting myself, right? And so my problem is the opposite, mm -hmm. that there are times when I just have to say, okay, I'm done, I'm done, it's over, I'm letting it go. So I always try to do my best, my goal, oh, this is something good for you. So when I turn in my work, I try for my work, especially if I'm working with an editor for, or somebody for the first time. When I turn in my work, I want my work to be so clean that the person, um, that it, and by that I mean it doesn't have a lot of mistakes in it. Like I want it to be so good that when I turn it in, the person wants to work with me again. And the first time I work with anybody, I turn my work in early. I turn it in early. And um, so I'm a writer, but I can also edit. So I'll write it and I'll also try to edit it as much as possible because my goal is to get hired again. And so I'll actually lots of times do the editor's job for them because I want them to hire me again. So usually my standards are too high and usually what I'm trying to do is give myself a break because you'll make yourself nuts trying to make things perfect. I make myself nuts sometimes trying to make things perfect. So sometimes really what I need to do is allow myself to be imperfect and let it go sooner. Mm -hmm. you've, you've done a lot of things that I'm impressed by where it has to be difficult at times to be a woman in, 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 in general and, and specifically a black woman. Mm -hmm. Where, where, where you worked in corporate America, where you, you work in publishing and you, you speak and you do all these things and you're interviewing people. Um, what, what, what challenges have you found as a black woman and what, what have you done to overcome them? Mm -hmm. So when I used to work for big companies, lots of times I would have this experience where I might be the only black woman in the room or the only black person in the room and it's a room full of white people. And white people are fine, but sometimes how they've been socialized is to not see us or to not hear us. And so sometimes as a black person, I would find this, and white women find this too with men, but sometimes I would say something and it was like nobody heard what I said. So I would say it 
And then 10 minutes later, it would be usually be a man, it would usually be a white man, would say the exact same thing, like he made it up. And people would respond to it like he was the first p- person who would say it. And I'd be like, I just said that, <laughs> right? And um, so I had that a lot. I felt invisible sometimes. Um, I would feel erased sometimes. I would feel lonely. I'd feel very lonely sometimes. And I was in my 20s, and when I would think about, wow, if I feel this isolated and this lonely in my 20s, assuming that I get promoted, how lonely will, my, will I feel? And so part of my decision to stop doing that was because I didn't want to um, become more and more isolated. Mm-hmm. I didn't think that that would be healthy for me. Um, what was the question? <laughs> <laughs> Um, Oh, what did I encounter? Okay. All right. So, so now I work for myself. So now I'm the boss. I'm in charge. I only work with people who share my values, who share my view of the world, who share um, um, interests and who I like. And so if you continue to ignore me, if you talk over me, if you interrupt me, that used to happen all the time. We will not be working together anymore because I will quit you. And um, let's see, I don't do any work that's not consistent with my values. Um, Yeah, so now I'm in charge. So, so what do you But can I say something about that? So I'm in charge, but I want to be the kind of, partner in a project or collaborator, or sometimes I I do have people who support me and who work for me and that kind of thing. But I want to be a good boss too. So I think that that's important to role model what it looks like. Um, Yeah, to role model what it's looked like, to what what it looks like to be a loving person, a caring person, a kind person, a person who cares about other people's stories, who takes care of um, in confidential information that other people share with you. So I think all of that's important. So what do you like about teaching? Okay. I like, okay. So right now you all are looking at me and you see my two eyes and you see Robert's two eyes, right? I'm looking at you and I get to see all your eyes. So what's inspiring to me is I can see people's eyes light up. Like I see, like you can see when you connect with different people, like you see the look on it. So I see like right now a whole room of people and I can see, you know, like I can see your body language. I can see, you know, who's like this, who's like this, who's, who's, <laughs> right? So I can see all that. And so I like, um, inspiring people and engaging people. And I like sharing knowledge. And I like the fact that in my life, I've been exposed to all these things. And I love to take information I have and just give it away. I think that's like the most amazing gift to be able to share information with other people. And then even though I'm sitting in the front of the room or Robert and I are in the front of the room and we're the teachers, I'm really looking forward to learning from you as well. So. So I have two more questions. One is that it, um, one of the things I've learned from them is that part of what they want to do as a group is really sort of take charge of the narrative about their yeah. country and their people and their continent and their culture. So if you could tell them anything about the United States of America that you, that you would hope would enlighten them about your culture, the culture in which you live now, what would that be? Yeah, so here's the thing. So... Part of the intention of this program is for us to come here and to share with you um, ways that you can do that, that you can change the narrative in the world about Ethiopia and tell the world all of who you are um, and about all the different aspects of life here, not just this story that we hear over and over in the media, right? And so the irony of this is as an African-American, I have that exact same challenge back at home. So the same media that told the story of Ethiopia that's only drought and famine and poverty, like that story is the same media 
that African Americans are trying to get to tell a, a, a more holistic story of us, not just that we're criminals and that we're poor and that all these negative things that they tell about us. And so we're able to do that with some success, but we haven't figured it out yet completely. Mm-hmm. And so, um, you know, I wrote on, on my Facebook page today that personally, my big goal and what I hope to learn from you, and I don't expect like anybody to come up to the front of the room and be like, oh, I have the answer, <laughs> right? But I think that by interacting with you, I'm gonna learn a little bit about this from you, is so African-American people, we have a lot of privilege and we have a lot of opportunity and a lot of things, many of us, that come with being Americans, right? But the price of being African-American is also very high. So we come from um, um, a line of people who were enslaved. Um, For much of my father's life, he couldn't vote. Like he had all these negative experiences as a black person. So I am, and maybe we, were kind of born into the first generation of people who um, in the civil rights movement, they fought for us to have fair opportunities. And so we walk through these doors and we have these opportunities and we work for these companies and these organizations. And I'm on the other side of the world. It's amazing to me. And we still struggle in the United States. And if you walk around um, in a lot of communities in the United States, um, a lot of black people look very depressed. Like we're depressed, we're hurting, it's painful. And so part of what I'm hoping to learn from you guys as the only nation on the African continent where you haven't been colonized, I'm hoping to learn something about freedom from you guys or something about your um, self-esteem and pride that I can learn from you and take back to the United States and maybe share there. Um, So that's part of my intention for this trip Um, because we share some similar struggles. I suspect that maybe in your country here in Ethiopia, you figured out some things that we haven't figured out in the United States, and maybe we've figured out some things that maybe you haven't figured out here. But by communicating with each other um, and supporting each other and coming together, that perhaps we can come come, um, um, discover some answers that help liberate all of us and help all of us be more free and be perceived in the world more holistically and have our humanity seen and appreciated more broadly. My last question is, if you could give one piece of advice to an aspiring storyteller, what would that be? Mm. So I think that I would, the thing that I would say to you is, okay, I'm very spiritual. So God made each and every one of us unique, right? And just like in, the, um, in nature, in the animal kingdom, every animal, vegetable, mineral, like everything is unique and it serves a unique, uh, unique place in the ecosystem. Like if you cut down all the trees, we won't be able to breathe, right? Um, that kind of thing. And so I think that Every human being is unique, and I think that every human being is absolutely necessary for the well-being of humankind all around the world. And I think that we are like interlocking puzzle pieces, like like the more you share with people and you talk with people, you find out things that you have in common. And I think we're puzzle pieces and we all (coughs) fit together. but sometimes we can't see this about each other. And so what I would say to you is that um, the things that make you unique, the things that make you different from the person who's sitting next to you or from your brother or sister or your neighbors, I think that those things are necessary in the world and the things that make you different, embrace them and bring them to your storytelling. Um, If I were you, I would not try to imitate anybody else I would try to be the best version of myself that's possible. That's what I would say to you. 